Okay, so okay. please. I'm very happy to introduce our speaker today. Uh, his name is Tapagata Neogi. Apparently, I say that quite nicely, but <laughs> much more memorable for you, he's allowed me to call him, and you may call him too, Tintin. That's his. That's his um, pre preferred name while he. In the West. And, um, <laughs> elsewhere. So maybe those of you who don't even know what Tintin is, for me it's from something very familiar, very memorable. I love Tintin. <laughs> <laughs> the comic strip. Yeah. <laughs> so um, Tintin is, uh, got his, received his PhD uh, last year and uh, from the University of Exeter in Britain, south in Southwest Britain, and the title of his uh, of his dissertation is quite similar to the title of his talk today. It was called "Technology and Identity: An Ethno-Archaeological Study of the Social Context of Traditional Non-Ironworking uh, in Northern Tan Ta Telangana, Telangana. Telangana, sorry, in <laughs> India." And his advisor is Professor Julian Julef who, um, in Exeter, who was a great friend and colleague of somebody here who worked for many years. She was a graduate student under my supervision, um, working on the same material. And the work that Julian Julef and Tintin were working on in the same topic of historical uh, early, very early iron working was in the neighboring area, so very close to uh, Thelma Lowe, who was the graduate student, and many of her family are here today. We had a meeting yesterday. Unfortunately, um, Thelma Lowe died before completing her PhD work, although not really before completing her research. She had already amassed a huge amount of data documents, samples, and um, images, all of which are stored here in Berkeley. And Tintin and his wife, um, Chelsea, Chelsea <laughs> have been here for the last two weeks preparing this material with, um, with Thelma's brother, JB, here, who works in, son, in Berkeley. Son. Son. Thelma's son. Oh, sorry. Okay. Say, no, got, got the, uh, got. Excuse me. Of course, this is his son. No worries. No worries. <laughs> this is Thelma was working on her research in the 1980s. So obviously, this is Thelma's son. Um, so they, they were, they've been working and preparing the archive for storage and for reanalysis and for recontextualizing the material with um, the new material that that Tintin and Julian Julev have been working on in, um, in the neighboring area. So that's really giving you a context of where, uh, what Tintin is doing here. We hope that he'll be back, if not in Berkeley, at least in the United States as a postdoc in the near future <coughs> to continue the work and to finalize the, the work and the reuse of Thelma's archive, which would be wonderful. Um, so, I would also like to tell you that he's very interested in heritage in general, ethnoarchaeology of iron, but also heritage, and uh, is, has a non-profit, I think, is it a non-profit? No, it's a for-profit, oh, for social... For, for okay. one of those for-profit, for social good yeah. companies, uh, in which he, if you're ever in Calcutta, he will take you around the historic buildings of uh, 17th century, 18th century Calcutta, built by the European colonists. So you can have, or imperialists, I should say. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, so you can um, have one of his tours, his audio tours and actual walking tours around the city. I think that would be lovely. It would, I'd like to go to Calcutta for that. And some Thank food. you. <laughs> so anyway, let's welcome uh, Tintin here. He's, uh, he'll be here for a few more days, but um, if any of you uh, want, wanted to talk more about what he's doing, but um, right now, let's welcome him to give him his talk. Thank you. Pre-industrial ironworking in central India, a new perspective.
and is from Telangana in India. Okay, thank you very much, Ruth, and thanks everyone for having uh, me here. Am I audible at the back? Yes. All right. Um, so there's a lot to unpack. I'd, uh, I might go over time, so please, someone time me if, if possible. Right, okay. Um, and also it might look a bit everywhere, all over the place, because I've not in included everything um, in it. So feel free to ask questions at the end. Um, okay, so I'll start by introducing the area um, in India. So we're working in central India, so in this part of, uh, part of India, which is um, um, which in earlier was a part of uh, a, a big state called Andhra Pradesh, but very recently while I was doing my PhD research, it was um, divided into two states. The, so Telangana is the new state that came out of this uh, new uh, political arrangement. Um, and the, by northern Telangana, I mean these four districts of, of Telangana state, and you can see this river here. This is the Godavari River, which is um, basically the, the, the main uh, river that provides uh, water for agriculture and everything for in this very in the semi-arid uh, area. And our research, or my PhD research, focuses mainly in this district here and this district. Here, so it's basically equally divided by on both sides by the by the river, but the landscape is different on on, on both sides. So in the south, here the landscape is more agrarian, uh, more um, villages, less hills, uh, sporadic sporadic distribution of hills, and um, uh, more fields and stuff. In north here, it's it's mostly dense forests, and most of my sites here and the um, iron smelters with whom I worked, they live in, inside a tiger reserve, so there were an issue of there was an issue of accessibility, as well. But the sites here in the in the forest are better preserved. Sites in the habitation area are not, um, like more inhabited areas are not, unfortunately. Okay. So I'll put the the region in context to the the, uh, the whole of central India. Um, so this is where my two main towns are in my region. This is the, the river that's flowing uh, through there. And so Adilabad and Karimnagar are two district headquarters. And you can see that they are at the edge of this large forest tract that goes all around central India, that green patch. And this one here is, is actually a plateau, which we call Choranagpur Plateau, which is like a uh, very wide tabletop in, in, uh, surrounded by forests. And these things, this is in the north of this forest, forest track, northern edge in Netherhat, where I did some work with the tribal iron smelters, uh, where there, is, there are evidences, clear evidences of iron smelting. This is Keonjar in Orissa, which is towards the easternmost extent of the, of the forest track, and here there are also colonial records, recollections and stuff about iron smelting, although no one directly studied um, uh, the area yet. Bastar here, the very center of this, uh, uh, this forest area, has also has um, colonial uh, memoirs about iron smelting tribes living, uh, living there, as well as, um, as well as there is one ethnographic study done in the 1940s by Verrier Elwin uh, with an iron smelting tribe called Agarias. Uh, and then you can see these are, these are my study areas, which is towards the end, the southern edge of this forest area. Forest area. So now what really interests me in the, f uh, in, in, in the future is to see how uh, technology traveled through the forest track, because we know because of the recent uh, insurgency issues in the forest, uh, that uh, the, 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 the Maoist insurgents were traveling using the old pathways through the forest to travel from here to here. And they were evading um, the police and the military and, and everyone. So we know that there are old pathways, that paths that exist, and they're still active. And we're pretty sure uh, 
that, that technology and people use these pathways quite, quite a lot. So we need to, we would like to see how the interaction uh, built up in the past uh, and as, we go, as we go along with the, with the research project. Um, okay. So I'll give you a basic idea of how Telangana looks, my study area looks. So this is in Karimnagar. As I said, it's mainly a sporadic distribution of low hills like these as well, uh, and there it's mostly cultivated in, and agrarian villages, big agrarian, agrarian villages, with evidence of iron smelting very close to these hills and also the edges of, um, of different vill villages. And on the other side of the river, on the northern side of the river, it's mainly dense forests like these. This is in the, within, inside, inside the Tiger Reserve uh, with very good uh, evidence of continuous iron smelting for at least, uh, at least from the medieval, medieval period. There are earlier records, but we, don't, we are not allowed to collect samples and uh, uh, date them by the ASI and the local forest. Um, forest authorities. So we, we don't have any dates, but from Thelma's research, we know that the some dates are um, that go back to 1600s uh, from this from this area. Okay, and so the ore sources. There are two types of ores in my study area uh, and the area of but with Jill and we studied since 2010. We mainly find outcrops of banded magnetite like these, like huge boulders of banded magnetite on the, on the hills, um, which contain about from 60 to 70 percent iron, and it's very easily smeltable. Um, and this is where most of, the, most of the smelting in this area comes from banded, mag banded magnetite ore. But the area that uh, Thelma studied earlier, which is a, um, a neighboring area, has wide very wide outcrops of laterite um, ore. So it looks, the soil color changes dramatically if you pass on from one area to the, um, to the other. Um, and laterite, um, this ore has about 40 to 45 percent iron and it needs a pre-processing uh, pre stage uh, to, to smelt. So here the organization of smelting was, was different and it involved several other, uh, different other communities. Uh, because it was difficult to mine it and, um, and, and smelt it. But uh, this research, my research, do not go much into the laterite area because there is hardly any memory of laterite smelting uh, left. Because the magnetite uh, ore areas are mostly deep in the forests, uh, there are some isolated communities uh, who still recall, uh, who still have memories, direct memories of iron smelting from uh, 1930s, 1940s is the latest uh, memory of iron smelting there. And some of the iron smelters who participated in smelting in their early youth, they still, uh, they're still alive. Okay. Now, as we go along um, through the villages, we'll see very frequently huge slag heaps like these. So you can see the, this person here is about five feet, eight inches tall. So the slag, slag heaps are normally very like one story or sometimes two story tall slag heaps, but they have been quarried away because slag is a very important uh, building material there. Uh, they incorporate with mud to make it, uh, to make the mud brick bind uh, and they use it for, for building houses. So that is why the older slag, there's very less chance that the older slag heaps would survive. So most of the slag heaps that we encounter are mostly medi uh, medieval or late, uh, late medieval, but they have been frequently quarried away because to build, to build houses. Um, in the forests, we find huge areas of uh, a series of slag heaps. So here you can see this is one slag heap, this is another one. This is another one. This is another one, um, and there, there, there are a lot of slag heaps on, on further, further down. So these were probably a series of uh, smelting episodes. I'll explain later as we, as we, as we go and go along, and probably uh, indicate uh, specific time periods. Like each slag heap was probably from a series of 
five, ten years of intensive smelting, and then the community moved away and then came back um, later. Okay. So uh, a little more background of the research. So uh, the earliest um, written document about iron smelting in this area in Telangana comes from the VOC, the Dutch East India Company uh, trade documents, uh, as well as a lot of British, number of British documents and memoirs about uh, the direct uh, in, um, encounter with iron smelters and steel makers. And then there was not much research done until Telma, as a UC Berkeley PhD student, visited and uh, surveyed um, a neighboring area to our research area, where she found evidences of high carbon crucible steel production, or wood steel, as it, as it is called. Um, and then after her, in 2005, the, uh, a local historian, Dr. S. Jai Kishan, with support from the late professor Bala Subramaniam from IIT Kanpur, he, they would survey some sites, record some sites, but in a very, um, and not in a systematic way, but we know the locations uh, of where these sites were, and that basically attracted us at Exeter. I was a master's student then, a student then uh, with Jill, and that attracted us at, as Exeter to apply for funding through UQRE, which is in, a UK-India collaboration, uh, to do an initial <laughs> three-month-long uh, reconnaissance survey in the area to quantify what is there in terms of our geometallurgical uh, record. So I'll, so basically we surveyed at that time an uh, area of 120 kilometer diameter uh, where this circle is. Um, the pink dots here are the places that um, Thelma had surveyed um, earlier and also Dr. Jai Kishan had surveyed um, um, earlier. So this, this, the pink dots represent the steel making and laterite smelting area, but we surveyed the, the magnetite smelting area from here. And there is hardly any evidence of steel making in the magnetite uh, smelting region. Um, and the red triangles, these are the sites that I added later during my, my PhD field work. Um, so we found during the Pioneering Metallurgy Project uh, almost 245 locations uh, with iron uh, smelting evidence, and that includes slag heaps uh, and some evidence of, uh, of uh, mud brick forts where slag was incorporated within the structure and there was a slag heap nearby where, which was completely quarried to do, uh, to do that, etc. Um, and then these were all clustered into 100, about 120 sites. And then during my field work, I identified several more locations which were clustered into 10 more sites, mostly in the, inside the forest tract there in the, in the, in the forests. Um, also during the pioneering metallurgy survey, we found that there is, uh, that it had an uh, um, ethnographic element and we found, we spoke to the local iron, uh, iron working community and we found there are members of the community which has direct uh, knowledge of, of iron smelting. Sometimes they have indirect knowledge of iron smelting through their um, ancestors. Um, and, but it was not very clear how much knowledge exists and if there was a specific uh, iron, and iron, steel smelt, uh, iron smelting and steel making community in the area or whether, whether all the iron smelters and steel makers were also blacksmiths. So that this different distinction was not, not very clear. We had hints that there might be different communities. There might be separate, discrete communities, but we did not really, um, really know for sure then. But also, what we found is that there, the the, the metallurgical tradition was um, very important because there is this goddess here is a goddess of steel. It's um, the name of the goddess is Mamai, and in the steel making areas, the 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 blacksmiths who say that they, their ancestors were steel makers, they still worship the goddess during the New Year festival. And not, it's not that not every iron working community that worships them, only this, those who have, they claim that they have direct links with the steel makers, they only worship, worship the goddess. And so this is a very important, uh, interesting tradition that struck us uh, during, during the field work and we wanted to take it uh, forward. And also we conducted several uh, ethnographic um, interviews at that time because we had short time, so we had to 
come up with a, a questionnaire uh, which I personally did not did not like, but anyway, that was um, what we had to do to get in a maximum information in in a short period, and that also indicated a, a thriving tradition, iron iron working tradition, iron smelting tradition in the area. So this led to my uh, PhD research, and my research questions I have. Uh, approached it in two ways. First, I wanted to un understand the social context of smelting, and also I wanted to understand how uh, the iron smelting sites made sense from a, in, in the landscape, and whether the community, the, 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 the uh, descendants, the extent, extent members of the smelting community could, have, um, could, could help us understand the sites from in, the, in their own way. Because when we did the survey, the, all these sites looked scattered and did not really make much sense, except for the clear laterite magnetite um, divide. Because in the magnetite area, all the sites look very scattered without any like any uh, sense. And laterite area, the sites look very scattered without much uh, much sense to them. So we wanted to understand why the sites are there where they are. Where they are. So in the social context, I wanted to know who the iron smelters and steel makers were, and can their memory help in any way in unraveling the socioeconomic organi organization of production? In the, in the course of my fieldwork, I realized that there is almost no uh, memory of steel making. Like the steel making probably has, uh, had vanished by the mid-1800s mid when steel started to be imported from England uh, to India. And that was, the steel was more, that became cheaper and more easily available and English, uh, during my course of my PhD, I found out that there are several forest laws which were imp implemented there in that area specifically to stop uh, steel makers from accessing charcoal so that uh, the English steel is, is sold. Uh, there's a market for English steel. Uh, okay, so, and then I wanted to know if iron smelting, steel making, and blast smelting represent discrete specialized craft traditions. And therefore, these were whether they were these iron maker, iron smelters, steel makers, and iron workers with different communities, uh, which was not very clear during our pioneering metallurgy fieldwork, because whoever you will ask, they will say that well, we are just iron workers, we are from that caste, and that's all, that's it. They won't even try to talk about anything else. Um, and then uh, I wanted to know how they are placed in the local. Uh, rural space in Telangana, both in, both in terms of social space uh, and the social hierarchy, as well as uh, physical space, where the, the iron smelters are located in terms of the villages um, uh, or in terms of the entire landscape, how they situate themselves in terms of other, uh, in, in relation to the smelting, uh, smelting sites as well. And then in the landscape aspect, I wanted to know why the smelting sites are are there where they were, because it did not make much sense during the pioneering metallurgy project. Um, also, what can the distribution of archaeological evidence of smelting and steel making tell us about the nature of the organization of production? So whether uh, the evidence is similar throughout, whether there's a uniform distribution of the evidence, and if not, uh, if there, there are differences and what can, uh, where, whether these were done by different communities with different uh, organizations of production. Um, also, can an ethnographic study of the extent iron smelting community help in understanding the production landscape? Can we take the, the, the iron smelters who are still alive and who still recall, uh, have memory of smelting, can, they, can we take them to the smelting sites or can they take us to the smelting sites, sites and try to uh, help us understand the sites from their perspective because it will probably make we will probably understand better if they explain the site to, to us. Okay, so, uh, so the survey, uh, the study area closely resembled uh, the one followed in pioneering metallurgy, during the pioneering metallurgy survey, and over three long seasons of field work. So in UK, you know, probably the, the PhDs are four year long, and you get three years of funding, and the fourth year you have to submit. So it's not much, uh, much time. So uh, three seasons of field work, uh, which is most of the three years. Uh, uh, the research, were, we, I worked closely with 74 traditional iron workers, 13 of whom had directly participated in iron smelting in their youth. 
and they are like among these 13 by then by the time that my PhD finished five of them five or six of them had already passed away um, uh, so this the knowledge is going and going out uh, and many of many of the rest uh, said that they have recollection about smelting from what they heard from their um, their grandparents or parents even. Um, the survey methods included a sustained ethnographic study through unstructured or semi-structured interview. I pre prefer the preferred the previous one because we would then strike a friendship and then gradually uh, segue into smelting and then uh, people will be willing to show us more sites and, and, and talk, talk more about themselves um, uh, with the interlocutors and then a fre frequent site visits with them to understand the sites through their eyes. Uh, so we would just go to the, uh, we will ask them to take us to the sites and explain what happened where, how this organization of space happened in the site, how, who was participating in each and every activity um, and uh, what they were doing because they were uh, in, in my among these thirteen uh, elders, smelter el elders. There were there were at least two smel um, smelters who were um, who had a limp, in, in, and they 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 were their job was to sit beside the furnace and supervise the furnace making process. Uh, so they did not know how charcoal was made, but they were they had the best description of how a furnace would be made because they were supervising it. So each and every one had their own roles and we wanted every, each of them to tell us what they, what they did and how they s have seen everything organized. Okay, so this brings us to the, the problem of, of community. So Muddha Kamari, Muddha means bloom and Kamari means, means um, iron work, blacksmith. So the Muddha Kamari uh, is a community of iron smelters. That's what's, what the community term is in, in, in Telangana. So the, a smith that makes bloom. But Kamari, only Kamari is, uh, is a blacksmith. So whenever we'll ask someone who has, who had direct um, link to iron smelting, they would say, oh no, but we are not from this community. We are from this one. This community does not exist, that's a myth. So that you must have read somewhere and, and it's, it's not true. Now the fact that they were saying that and the fact that I have known from, from at colonial writings and also the local uh, Dr. Jai Kishan's work, work that, that Muddha Kamari definitely was a distinct community and the fact that they were denying it told, told me that there was something going on here. And it was very difficult for me in the beginning at the early stages of field work to to identify the difference and to see what was actually going on. So before I go in, um, in depth, I will try to explain what, was, what the current cost structure is there. there. So the, the blacksmiths and, and four other um, craft group, they come under the Vishwa Brahmin caste, which is obviously uh, like, which we don't see in any of the records, census records or anything until the 1930s. So this is definitely a manufactured uh, uh, caste, new caste group uh, where the, these groups were, the, the, the various village craft groups were, were trying to unite together when, at, the, at the time when their crafts were attacked, uh, I mean, were in a crisis because of a lot of industrialization going on and all that. So, and they wanted to ask for their better, uh, a better livelihood for themselves, a better representation in politics and stuff after independence. So the Vishwarman caste really, that the term and the identity really starts becoming big after independence when they enter polit like democratic politics. And, um, and they start having different, like appropriating the Brahmin semiotics, uh, of semiotics of Brahmin identity and say that we were Brahmins too but the Brahmins at some point in the past uh, kicked us out and we are, I mean, just like how caste histories, histories work. Um, so some studies show that they are persecuted Brahmins so far and now they're just their time to take back the, um, the thing. So the blacksmiths uh, very much form, the Kamaris very much form a part of this Vishwarmin caste at present. So everyone would say that, oh, we are Kamaris and also 
our caste is Vishnu Brahmin, and we are uh, BCB, backward class B, which gives them a lot of uh, the community, a lot of lot of uh, access, a lot of resources, and they would fight to keep their status. But that's their so that's what the 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 uh, their political uh, uh, fights are. Uh, then there. So if we take a cl closer look. All of these five groups, they worship Veera Brahman the Swami, this person, who uh, is a patron demigod of the caste, and who is believed to have led a social movement against the Brahmins in the 17th century. Um, and the members of the caste wear sacred thread, like the Brahmins. Uh, and there is also a thread ceremony uh, every year. So they change the sacred thread every year during the new year. Um, and more, most importantly, there are temples dedicated to the demigod. The, the, the Brahmins are not allowed, so they worship themselves. They, they worship, they have their own priest group that, that does the worship. The Brahmins are not allowed anywhere near the temples. Um, and they perform their identity in similar ways, in almost identical ways, by observing the same festival there's and almost as identical rituals as the Brahmins. So they would ha be, be, be taking vegetarian diet at some some times of, of the month, like the um, new moon, as opposed to the Brahmin's full moon, because they want to show that the difference. Um, and also they would have their own days, ritual days, festival days, where they would be, uh, the, be eating vegetarian diet um, and just try to as, like, access the Brahmin semiotics, the Brahmin identity, basically. Um, and the caste associations that are there also propagate a unity among all craft group and seek a better access to resources and power in the caste hierarchy through democratic political pathways. This is what I explained uh, in the earlier slide. The Kamari and the Wadla, the blacksmith and the carpenter communities generally cons consider cash transaction as impure um, and sinful and they would only accept payment in crops from a traditionally fixed set of clientele in the village. So, and this is even going on today when there is less and less crop available to, to give away as, as prestation um, uh, payment because the, the farmers, the, the government is, is, is giving a better in incentive if you give the crop to the government. Um, the farmers are doing that and that is why the, but the blacksmiths and the carpenters are still refusing to take cash payment and that is causing them their craft to decline, but they're still holding on to this purity uh, tea ritual. And, and the, the, those who, who mention uh, the, the, sorry, the, the smelters, those, the, the members of the smelting community who think, uh, who say that they have direct links with the smelting community, they also perform all these identity rituals. And they also insist that work only by, on, with crop and not cash and everything. So this made me look, uh, like start peeling off the, the homogeneity that was there for the Kamari, the, the blacksmith, unified blacksmith identity. And I looked through census data, I looked through uh, memoirs, colonial documents, and how uh, these groups start talking, like talk about, them, about themselves in the, in the census, because the older census, the early censuses where, where these groups were required to say who they were. Uh, because now after independence, talking about caste is not legal in India, so you don't know what, what caste they're, they're saying they are. But the colonial censuses, the, the census enumerators would ask you what caste you are. And many groups were trying to invent their identity by saying they're a certain caste. As you have uh, probably familiar with Nick Dirks' work um, about, 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 about he talks about, about this in some extent. So, um, so going to that, uh, uh, um, back to the census data and, and, and back to their memories, memories of, of uh, uh, iron working communities who I worked with, at some, by an early 1900s, this, this Kamari identity would look, would not exist, basically. So some were agricultural tools forger who call themselves Kamaris, of course, uh, some forged stuff for the Tory tappers, who would obviously wanted to take payment in cash because they would not be paid in toddy. Um, toddy is a palm, uh, palm wine. So they would not be paid in bail, like 
bottles of toddy. They, they just take cash. Um, and also all the other groups, the scissor makers, the sword makers, the ammunition makers, they were all urban, uh, urban um, iron working groups and they were getting paid in cash. But only after 1930s, when, when gradually these uh, professions were dying out uh, because Hyderabad was modernizing and it was becoming more integrated, uh, like modernizing, getting prepared for um, a more modern form of like when India was, as India was moving towards, uh, towards independence, uh, there's more industrial products coming up, Industri industrialization was having a big way in, in, happening in big way in India. These groups were all dying out and that is when they were all coming into the Kamari fold, the village blacksmith fold. They were moving from the, village, uh, from the towns to the villages and they were taking up work as village blacksmith. And this was also supported by the fact that the, the older big land holdings were also going out and the land was redivided between, distributed between smaller farmers, so there were more farmer clients available in the villages. So there were, the farmer clients needed more blacksmiths to work for them, produce material, uh, agricultural tools for them. So, so that gave them an opportunity to move back to the villages from the towns and become blacksmiths and that caused them, that, and that caused this huge Kamari blacksmith identity to come up. And if you move back to the villages and take, become a Kamari, you also have to behave like a Kamari. You have to wear a sacred thread. You have to uh, not pay, uh, take payment in cash. Uh, you have to behave like, like them. So the one thing that made me, uh, among these groups, made, uh, made, uh, stood out is, is how every one of them talked about the smelters. The smelters denied that there was a different smelting community, but everyone else said that, yes, there was a different smelting community. And they said all these things about them. This is just a, uh, a key, like keyword of what I heard throughout my field work. So they would say they are not us, they're dirty, they're, they, they take money, they are of low origin, they are laborers, they touch slag. Now slag is, is thought, as, thought of as excrement of the furnace. So if you touch it, you are impure. So they touch slag, they're fake comeries, they're fake, fake blacksmiths. But what really put me on, a, um, on, 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 on the scent is that they, they, everyone, almost everyone said we don't marry them and we don't live with them. And that made me, made me look at two things. I looked, uh, started looking at like, going to the villages and talking to this, those who have direct um, memory of smelting or indirect memory of smelting talking to them and taking their genealogies. So maybe if, they were, if no one else was marrying them, they might be marrying within the community. So I, I, I took huge, uh, like I took uh, pages and pages after pages of genealogies, uh, which they permitted me to use in my research. Um, um, and we, I started looking at where the, 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 these families who has direct linked to smelting, they were they're staying in the village. So they were, and I found that they were always staying at the village boundaries, very close to the slag or like slag heaps or the remains of iron, smel iron smelting. They were not integrated with the other um, iron working communities in the village. Uh, so if you look at the genealogies, I went to the field, collected genealogies like this. I mean, it was more, more in rough form. I come back home, come back to, the, to where I was staying and then I'll uh, put them in a March fair form like this. Um, and uh, this is just to give you one example. This is the Kuchanapalli family. Inti Peru means surnames or caste name. Uh, so Kuchanapalli uh, is, the, is, the most, is the biggest uh, smelting family that's still, or, uh, still there in my study area. And I have taken uh, their genealogy for the last four generations because that's how much, how far they remember. And this is from different people from the same family in different villages. And so the MK here, is the Muddha Kamari. So they married Muddha Kamaris. Mostly you can see there's only um, differences here where for instance they married a Kamari and they married two migrant uh, blacksmith family who came from outside. So if they were marrying outside mostly, and this is the case for all the genealogies that I collected, if they were, they were very rarely marrying the, the Kamari and that is more in the present generation where they would sneer the elders would sneer that this is a love marriage that happened that's not um, acceptable. Um, 
but if and but most cases if they were marrying outside the community they were marrying the immigrant marathi blacksmiths who came into the area after the 1950s and and 1960s um so is a representation of percentage in the last four generations then 87% of the marriages happened within the community uh, with their first cousin uh, relations uh, and only 13% of the marriages happened outside the community now then i decided to follow the the leads about about where their other family members live and where they were getting married to so that led me to uh, this is for the same family led me to all of these villages and that happened with 14 other families that I collected genealogies of so i that led me to a several a number of, of of villages in the area where there are still um members of of the of the smelting community living there and, and interestingly near all of these villages within 10 kilometers within a 10 kilometer uh radius there would be a cluster of smelting sites so they're living still living very close to smelting areas so I'll, show you the next map so the the black triangles are where the families are now like the smelting families are now and the reds are smelting sites so you can see the cluster you can cluster them almost so it it became a map of both where the community is uh and also where the sites are so following the genealogy helped me map the area in 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 a in a different way and see the 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 distribution of the sites in a different way now um uh, talking about landscape we would what would um stump us every time in during is stump a cricketing word i'm no, sorry okay okay <laughs> i'm sorry if it was uh so what would um <laughs> uh what would um really uh confuse us during the during the pioneering metallurgy project is that we would see all these outcrops large hi hills of uh, magnetite we would climb the hills we would go around the hills and we would find no mining evidence we know there are smelting sites but there was no mining when i mean we did not find any mines any any mining pit or any place where they were they're breaking the the magnetite off so how were they they smelting that was a big question we did not we did not really have any answer to that um and when during my field work i would repeatedly ask my interlocutors they would say well are you mad we are little people we can't climb those hills and it it takes a lot of people to bring down those heavy things we have easier ways to mine we collect it in much easier way nature gave us things from where we collect um through which we collect um ore more easily now it turned out um uh, that karimnagar district with the one that is that is more integrated agricultural district it was integrated uh into an agrarian landscape in 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 the 13th and 14th centuries um where there was a powerful kingdom which uh in order to improve agriculture they excavated several agri um, agrarian um, several canals and these canals were all connected to like either originated from a main stream like this or they were connected to uh these scattered hills where during monsoon the rainwater will be collected in a, a like will come down through a canal into a reservoir uh, like these and then this will be distributed to a network of reservoirs and canals through different villages so what the muddakamaris there figured out is that um so the some of the canals are still active but many most of them have been uh, cut off um and that caused older villages to to vanish as well um so what the muddakamaris figured out is that if uh, that this monsoon brings down iron like magnetite sands magnetite sediments erodes magnetite sediments from the magnetite outcrops and brings them down with them so if they could collect the these sediments before the can the canals go in in a big reservoir then they have already processed pre-processed automatically processed ores which they don't have to break down pulverize uh and they would be able to then put it in a furnace and smelt it much more easily so they have then have a name for this black sand it's called wuske uh and 
they used to, I mean, that, that became a practice. So wherever there is a, a canal coming into, into a reservoir, they would be going there to collect ore and there would be smelting right near it, like very close to, very close to it. Uh, so this is a big reservoir in one of the village, the older reservoirs that survive. And near that, there would be sand, like there would be, if the canal, canal had di dried out, there would be still black sand deposits like this because no one has collected them for ages. And this black sand is what the magnetite sand looks like. That's what Buske is. And, you, and there's a huge weight difference between normal sand and the, and the magnetite sand. Magnetite sand is really heavy. I had collected some samples, but it was confiscated in the Hyderabad airport because it went off in the in the metal detector. Uh, um, so, and they would place what Jill calls rifles, like these. Uh, these are granite with, marked with pockets, and these would be placed at the edge, uh, the junction, at the juncture of where the, the canals drain into the reservoir, so that uh, after every fresh monsoon, the, the, the community will go and collect uh, whatever is, is, is uh, held there, whatever they, whatever gets deposited there in terms of the, the sand, and then they will smelt right, right near it. Now, when Jill visited with in, in 1980s, this is, from, this is a picture from 1980s, um, these rifles were still existent, but now they've all been removed, so I didn't see any of them. But since I had Jill's notes and the picture, I knew how, what they were talking about, what, what my interlocutors were talking about. Um, so I'll give you examples of two sites. This is a Timapur site. Um, in my study area, which you can see this is a large slag heap, which is almost a story high, more than a story high. Um, and it's been partially quarried. But so this is where it is here. Um, and this, this pink line is, is, the, is the main irrigation canal that was dug in the, in the 14th century and was connected with some uh, like subsidiary canals which drained into the reservoir which then watered was used to, to, to cultivate the, the hinterland around here. So what uh, the, the members of the community here, the older members told me is that they would see their elders go here and collect sand after every fresh rain, every fresh uh, monsoon rain, and they would then uh, store it for a few, uh, for, a, for a few more days after, after there was enough sand collected, enough whiskey collected, they would then smelt it in, 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 in the furnace right near, um, near the village, very close to where they collected the, um, the ores uh, from. This is another site where um, you can see that the, uh, from the hill it's coming, the, the streams are coming down, these are all dry when I, and, and I actually walked all these streams with, with uh, this person who, who has direct memory of smelting. So I walked all of them and uh, you could see black sand deposits there because no one has been mining them for, for ages. And very close to that you can see there's two smelting, uh, smelting locations uh, just at, at, um, at the village boundary. Now in, for, the, for the forest sites it was a bit, bit different because uh, in, the, in the forest area they, uh, there was a large range of hill that passes through the northeast of the area rather than uh, small sporadic ranges, small ranges of hills. So, uh, and also the forest area was never incorporated within the agrarian base. Um, and that's, so there was no uh, planned um, canals. There were no planned can agrarian, agricultural canals. So what the Muddakamar is there, and that's why the settlements are all towards uh, in the edges of the forest and the smelting sites are inside the forests. Um, so what the smelters would do here is they would go to the forest during monsoon, like after fresh rains, every fresh rain, they would collect, uh, they would know where the depressions were in the streams, seasonal streams, and they would collect um, uh, whiskey, the, the black sand from, this, from those depressions, and they would smelt right near it, and that produces uh, smelting sites like, uh, like uh, huge uh, remains of uh, the slag heaps like these, and also some spread, like really well spread out slag, slag heaps like these, which are flattened uh, more, more recently. So this is one of the forest most impressive, one of the, the accessible and 
almost intact forest site. This is where a temporary habitation was for the, for the smelters. Um, and these are all the seasonal streams coming from a hill, which is outside the picture here. And they would, uh, there are depressions where they collected uh, ore from, and they, would, they smelted it right uh, near, uh, near, near where they collected ore from. And these uh, sites were also very close to clusters of the, plant, the tree that they used for, for, to make charcoal. Uh, and these, this, this, this tea tree, um, which they locally call Sendra. So Sendra uh, 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 tea um, tree just, um, it, it grows in clusters in the forest. And the smelters knew where the clusters uh, were. Uh, and they would move from one cluster to the other. They would ex exploit the, the cluster completely and they would let the, let the cluster grow back. So they would not come back to that cluster before 10, 15 years, which is how long it takes for the, for the cluster to grow back. So, um, and they would move on to the next cluster and then they would come back after 10, 15 years to see if the cluster has grown back and then they use the cluster again. Uh, so they were always moving through the, through the forest and each, smel I have a hunch that each of these melting uh, uh, sites, uh, slag heaps, a series of slag heaps were created up for, for each of the uh, divided by time. Like when, when they came back and re-smelted, they put the slag somewhere else. And then when they came back again after 10, 15 years, they would put the slag somewhere, somewhere else, but very close in the, in the landscape. And in there, you would also see, I mean, because these sites are more or less intact, you would see, um, uh, remains of furnaces like these. This is probably, uh, this was a furnace base for, sort of supported by granite. And in, in this, this place is where the furnace would be was, is now packed with slag. And there are a lot of tap slags found here, which is probably where the, the slag tapping channel was, but we're not allowed to do an excavation uh, um, by the forest authority, so we could not uh, dig. And we had uh, forest, um, tracker with us, always keeping an eye on us, so. Um, so organizational production, it was different in both, area, uh, in different areas. So entirely keen based uh, production in Adilabad in the forest areas, but because due to the sporadic distribution of hills and therefore dispersed accessibility of ore, the production agrarian plain of Karim Nagar was uh, and not entirely uh, community based. So I'll explain it more in the next couple of slides. Um, so in Adilabad, in the forest area, the furnace construction, ore collection, processing, charcoal making, everything was done uh, by the community. And then smelting was done by a group of six, uh, mem uh, six member team where it was a mixed level experience. So there were some apprentices who, who manned the bellows and put charge into, into, the, into the furnace and they would be supervised by at least two or three um, senior smelters. And then the bloom was refined by cutting in half and um, constant hammering at a smithing hearth. And then the bloom was equally divided between all the participants in smelting. And then each smelter sold a portion of the blooms that they got to an itinerant businessman who would then take it to the, to the markets and sell it in the markets. And the remaining portion of the bloom was sold to their farmer clients uh, who, have, who were required to buy the bloom from them and then give it back to them as a sort of a, some sort of a, um, ritual arrangement to to uh, to forge agriculture implements, which the farmers would then buy against crop. Um, so it looks very roundabout. In the in Karimnagar, in the more agrarian landscape, uh, the furnace construction, ore collection, and processing of charcoal was done by hired laborers because uh, the landscape was dispersed and sources of charcoal and everything was very much very dispersed. So they, they, the community needed to hire laborers probably from the local, like mostly from the local tribal community who are in the same social fringes as, as the smelting community to do this work for them. And then they were supervised by a, a smelter. And then the smelting was done by a group of hired laborers to operate the bellows, feed the church to the furnace, etc., and under the supervision of two or three experienced smelters. And then the laborers were paid in cash, sometimes in kind, but very rarely. And the bloom was sold to the sahukar or the itinerant like, businessmen who would, who gave them advances. And the sahukar would in turn sell the bloom in the regional market, which is same as the previous one. 
but then if they had a farmer had farmer clients, the farmers would have to buy the buy the bloom from the market, and bring it back to them, and then they would forge the implement, and then get paid by uh, paid by cash. So it's very roundabout arrangement. So they were trying to both be smelters and blacksmiths, like rich blacksmiths. Um, are there any evidence of control? Uh, the, the smelting sites that are located near the steel making areas uh, in the laterite zone, they have mud brick uh, enclosures like this, where the owners of these enclosures uh, of this land, they, they own this land for generations. And they tell, uh, they told, like uh, at least a few of them told, told me during my survey that, that their great great grandparents would have iron smelters, bring iron smelters there with incentives and they would be made to, uh, to, make, to smelt uh, iron and they would collect a tax from each furnace uh, based on uh, what, uh, and also collect a tax from what they sold basically. So the current production was much more controlled near the steel making area because steel was probably uh, more, uh, more, more prestige, more valuable um, item and iron smelted in the laterite area was one of the primary ingredients for, for, for steel. But other than that, there is no evidence of, of any direct control. At least there is no memory of any direct control and no archaeological evidence in terms of enclosures and stuff about any direct control. Um, and now, so I would want to end with by showing the, the, how the sites are vanishing and how the landscape is changing, which makes it an imperative to uh, really keep on doing this research before everything vanishes. So this is a site of Malapur in 2009. You can see this is a hill and it was connected to the, to the nearby tank uh, through canals where, and from where they, they collected the ore to smelt here in 2009. 2014, you can see part of the hill has been quarried away. And there, there are no connections with the tank. Um, and the tank w was gradually drying, uh, drying out. And then 2016, at the very end of my field season, you can see that almost all of the hill is gone. Um, so if anyone goes, and, and probably now, in, uh, you would probably not even know there was a hill there, uh, apart from memory, local memory. So if you go there and study the site now, or, or a few years later, it would, the landscape would not make much sense, because there is no hill that, that is connected to a canal and that drains, uh, drains into a, a, a pond where, from where the, the samples were collected. Uh, and this is happening very frequently everywhere in Telangana because it has become a new new state and there was a lot of funding going in to develop infrastructure and, and everything, new cities were, are coming up and all, and all that. So that makes it really important to both work on Thelma's, what Thelma saw in 2000, uh, sorry, in 1970s and 80s and what uh, we found when the sites were still there, uh, especially outside the forest areas. Forest sites would probably be safe for uh, hopefully, but uh, yeah. So yeah, that's. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, thank you for having me here. And so, any questions? Yes. So, um, how, how big are, are the furnaces? All the same type and size? Generally, pretty uniform, or are there different sizes and variety of furnaces? There are different sizes. Uh, they, the furnaces in the forest sites are normally smaller um, because I think because of the vegetation around and all that. But the furnaces in the in the village sites, uh, in the more agrarian area, they were normally seven to eight feet uh, high. So there are memories that you have to go up with a ladder to feed the furnace um, and and stuff. So they are different based on the based on again this divide between the forest area and a more agrarian um, landscape. So I, I just wanted to um, ask you about the sort of how this fits into the history of of iron and uh, smelting steel working in that part of India in general. Like, is, when are the earliest? When when does this whole industry start? Uh, so probably from the early historic, which is um, like third, fourth century, um, we find evidence of iron in megalithic burials. But 
those burial sites or megalithic burial sites do not corroborate with any smelting sites nearby, probably because all the slag has been quarried away for building, because this is a cultural practice to use slag as building material. And it seems that it has been there for, for quite, quite some time. Yeah, a long time. Yeah. So was this part of, was this um, iron working, was that common throughout India, or when, was this really a center of it? So this was a center.
kilns and stuff. So yeah, it's, it's inevitable, I suppose. <laughs>